Hello everybody, welcome to another Valheim video. Today uh, we have an interview for you with Gorthor, or Gorth. This is a fun conversation with somebody who had a totally different playstyle. Gorth doesn't really do much building, and most of the people I've talked to so far are really into building. So it was cool to speak to somebody who really enjoyed the communal and multiplayer combat aspects of Valheim. And he'll talk about like being in the body recovery squad and some other stuff. And it really opened my eyes to the ways that combat in Valheim can be viable long term. Because previously I had thought that it was just the building. But the key takeaway from this conversation for me was that, in fact, it's actually the interactions with other people. So whether that's done through building and sharing it online, or fighting and going to help someone get their body back or whatever, you're interacting with someone else in the game and that's what does it. That's just a theory though. You'll have to find out for yourself. Here's the conversation. Hello everybody, welcome to another Valheim video. Today I'm here with Gorthor. Is did I get it? Gorthor? Gorthar. 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 But everyone <laughs> just calls me Gorth. Hi everyone. Gorth. Gorth, I like that. I can pronounce that. Awesome. And so so the, the listeners have some context, Gorth. Um, I was under the impression before that most people who play Valheim a lot get into building, but you don't build. So you are a, a contradiction, and I, I would love to learn more about your experience and everything. So why don't we take a moment to just say hello? Maybe you can briefly introduce Hi, yourself. Yeah, my name is is that Gorth? This is an alias that I got for myself a long time ago, and it's it's stuck to the point that even Google believes it's real. So I got got used to it, and I just kept it. Um, yeah, I've been playing for a while Valheim since a few couple of years ago, and I'm what you what some people call a monogamous player. <laughs> I just play Valheim. That's it. Yeah, I mean, it's a gem, and Valheim's probably its best feature is its customizability. Um, really, the developers have they've taken this stance where they want to let the players play the game in their own way. And usually developers, maybe they have that in ideal, but in practice, they don't allow people to actually do that, you know? Whereas Valheim, especially with the world modifiers that were added in Hilda's request, um, they've, they've taken steps to really make sure that you can play the game game in lots yeah. of different ways. So it's a beautiful what, game that allows a lot of customization in many aspects of it. Yeah, absolutely. So let, let's get started with uh, what, what was going on with you and gaming before you started playing Valheim? What kinds of games were you playing? What was your overall feeling? Because obviously something was missing and then Valheim came around and boom, it filled that void, right? But did you have a sense that something was missing, or were you happy with gaming? What, what was going on? Okay, so this is going to sound even weirder. I did never game before. I never actually played many other games. I played some games when I was younger, like God of War, but that was briefly for a short time. Um, during the final stage, no, the begin middle stages of the pandemic, I was given a computer, and that computer just eventually led me to starting seeing some videos as well, and I was seeing a video from a guy called Vertigo Gaming, and he was doing a trial on Valheim, and actually liked the game, the aspect of it. Later on, me and my brother, we decided to both acquire the game, he must have played for about a couple of days. I stayed for a little bit longer. And yeah, since since then I've just been doing Valheim. I've tried other little games here and there, but nothing really does the same thing. That's so cool. I, I definitely was not expecting you to say that you hadn't played many other games before. I mean, it makes sense logically that there are people who Valheim is their first like main game that they got into. I just hadn't even considered that that was a thing. That, that That's really interesting. I just landed in Valheim and, and stayed. 
I mean, you're spoiled in that sense because because uh, a lot of the people, at least that I've spoken to, and myself included, um, like we love games, but it's kind of it's kind of hard to find games these days that are like made to be games that entertain you and are fun. A lot of games are just made to be profitable, and you know the the end result might be fun in certain angles, but. It's very complicated. So it's, it sounds like you got very lucky. You just got to yeah. go straight into Valheim. That that is very cool. Yeah, and I played around with single player mode for a while. I almost gave up on Valheim when I got to motor because she just ripped me apart. Um, eventually, I got a, got help from someone, a friend of mine that actually downloaded the game just to come and help me. He had played previously. We got our body, but if that person hadn't come and helped me, probably I wouldn't be playing Valheim nowadays. So, so you, I owe you a, got lot, through that a lot, lot of my experience spot. to him. Yeah, yep. He probably doesn't even know it, but I do owe a lot of my Valheim experience to him. Yeah, I think I think that's probably a common experience with people in the beginning, in particular. There's certain parts of the game where you get to them, and especially if you're doing solo. Uh, it's quite challenging, like, definitely. Yeah. And I made it the whole playthrough without cooking anything. Without I just cooking? Used the fire. <laughs> I just cooked on the fire and that was it. I looked at the recipes and I said, what the, no, I'll just put this here in the fire. It's perfectly fine. <laughs> and I did so. Serpent meat, all of it, all everything on the fire. Eventually, well, they, later on, when I met other people, someone actually got me around to, hey, do this because it's way better than that. I yeah, it certainly makes a huge difference, like having the stamina or having enough health to be able to block something. Yeah, yeah, it does. <laughs> Hence the dying over and over with motor. Yeah, but it's almost, you know, so I, I, I relate to some of the things you're saying. For example, like myself in Valheim, like, don't get me wrong, I've built things, and I build things on the server sometimes, because I sort of have to, and I know how to enjoy that process. But, I mean, compared to the, like, actual builders on the servers, I don't build. Like, I, I make stuff for other people to build in, and I make experiences for other people to have, and I build YouTube videos, right? But for me, the the thing that I really love about Valheim is the combat. and And so I can imagine, in some ways making the combat a bit more punishing can actually be quite fun because it's not like it's impossible to not use the food but it definitely would make combat harder if you're just it using did. cooked food <laughs> you know it did it did i had to learn the hard way but i eventually i did have you have you have you played many zelda games at all or no. heard about that <laughs> i know yes. I, know because, I know them because my kid i have a kid my kid plays ah, them. yeah my younger brother plays them as well yeah, so in Zelda, it's usually quite an easy game. And one of the gripes I always had is that there's not a hard mode. But I realized, just like you did with Valheim, that all you have to do is just not get extra health. Because every time you kill a boss, you have the option of picking up an extra heart so you have more health. But you could just skip that part, right? And so it's yep. funny how games, if you have the self-control... You can you can play the game in a way that makes it just as challenging as you want it to be. True, true. And lately, I've been um, I've been trying to get at least to the f initial stages, like Black Forest and up to the Mistland. I'm trying to see if I can make it there with the least amount of food possible. Just basically onion soup and a little more than that. Yeah, I've, that sounds like doable but with strategy because in Valheim so on the on the server I play on it's on very hard no map no portals so it's no, like I can do it though. <laughs> it's very it's 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 very punishing but when you die you don't lose anything so like your body you you keep your equipment but you don't lose any skill levels and your stuff like goes to the tombstone your inventory but aside from that, like you come back to life and you have all your gear, and if you have that quick slots mod, then you have three slots that you could put food in or whatever. So it's not, it's like, it's a very punishing server combat wise, but the actual experience of dying isn't, isn't that punishing. But the, the reason I bring it up is because what I've, what I've found is that on very hard, it, it sort of invalidates a lot of the food systems. Because, like, does it really matter how much health you have? 
if most of the enemies one shot you. Yeah, true, true. You have to learn the mechanics of each creature and learn how they move around and attack. And if you do that, you can pass by with a little bit of extra, but still that one shot is always going to kill you if it's an extra hard. Yeah, and it, it, it's, it's kind of the same scenario, whether you're on very hard or you're just using a little bit of food. Although the, the, the very hard monsters are, they're faster. I learned that the hard way. It's not just the health. <laughs> They're, they're like significantly faster. So like there's things you think you can outrun and then you try and outrun them. <laughs> no. <laughs> but, but so let, let's rewind a little bit. Let's go back to sure. um, when, when you started playing. You mentioned that you played with a friend and then mm -hmm. he left and another friend came back to help you with motor. And it's sort of yeah. like after that experience, it, I'm getting the impression, then you really you kept going i'm assuming because you said you would have stopped then so so let, let's yeah. continue there what, what happened next what did you get into after you made it through well, that motor bottleneck i made the realization that i wasn't going to be able to do it all by myself i could go far by myself but there's going to be a lot of situations that i would get stuck due to my naivety and inexperience so i started wandering the net and tapping around seeing where the communities were at I found a really nice community initially, where we st I started to enjoy more and more the group play aspect of it. And there were a lot of combat-focused people on that community, so maybe that's a little bit where it also came from. Like every community, it broke apart and I just went and searched for other ones. And on each community that I went to, on each new playthrough, I tried to get a little bit better with each weapon. Weapons I normally don't like and disuse. Everything except the gear. I can't use the gear for some reason. But yeah, it was the fact that I needed someone else to help me that opened up my views to I need to go and play with others. This game is cool, this game is wonderful, but with others it's it's way better. Yeah, really, and that's it where it shines, right? Where the magic comes through. Mm-hmm. Even just knowing, even if the person is not in the base right next to you, if the person is across the world, you know that someone else is out there and you might just run across them in the world. Just that gives depth to the world. It Absolutely. feels hollow if nobody else is there. Yeah, I, I noticed that as well, that like the biggest difference for me logging into a single player world is that it's too predictable. Like I feel like I know everything that can happen and where it might happen and where it's going to happen. Whereas on a multiplayer world, it's like people are so unpredictable. Like even if you get to know them well, it's, it's hard to predict exactly what they're going to do. And that element of unpredictability and like, like the, the thrills of like exploring and then you find a base someone else built or like you go somewhere and you left it one way, but somebody added stuff to it. And that feeling when you witness something someone else has done, it just, it really helps with the immersion. And it's a, an important part of the game for sure. So it you meant- Another quick thing, uh, cool thing that I did while I was searching for communities online, I came across this interesting community that was, you might have heard of it, was the Body Recovery Squad. Yes, yeah. Yeah, they were I really big at one point. Yeah, I used to roll with them and do body recoveries. It was a lot of fun. But then I found um, a server that was starting a new season. I made a video that really caught my attention, and I joined them. And I stayed there for a long while. It was a um, Jirok server. Ah, yeah, yeah, Jirok. I stayed there for a long while. I even made it to be an admin at a certain point. But eventually, we decided to do our own stuff and make our own server. So, yeah. And most recently, I've been, I was playing in the server of someone else that you might know, which was... Um, uh, what was it? Cosmo. I forgot his name. I'm getting blank. No, Bjorno. Ah, yeah, yeah. I was playing on Bjorno's server as well. Yeah. A lot of good people there as well. Ah, that's awesome. 
So, so you've touched on a point that I, I think could be quite useful for other people, because I've found that up to, you know, this is just my opinion, but up to one quarter of Valheim players want other people to play with, but they feel unable to find people to play with that are of the right type, let's say. Um, it, it appears that people sort of struggle to find other communities that they can join, that they really connect to. And I, I'm just saying this based off of polling that I've done for the people who watch my Valheim videos. And as I mentioned, up to a quarter of them, I mean, that's one out of every four players, feel that they want to do more in Valheim, but they don't know other people who love Valheim as much as they do, if that makes sense. It, it, seems, it seems to be a bit of a struggle for people. So could you talk a bit more about, like, how did you go about finding communities and coming across them? Were you just browsing Discord? What were you doing to, to get in touch with these other people to play with? Initially, I found them via YouTube, but then I jumped over to Discord. And uh, in several channels, more public channels of Alheim, there's always looking for a group or stuff like that. Word of mouth sometimes as well. Some Someone that I've played with in the past has told me, okay, we're going to open this server. Do you want to check it out? And like most people, I'll go in the server. I'll check out the mods. I'll check out the feel. I'll check out the progression stage of the world. And I think there's a, those, those things are what might bring someone in or drive them away. Because people have their own expectation of what Valheim is. Yeah. <laughs> and people look for someone that's like-minded or that, if not like-minded, that can connect and fill a gap in the group. And that's not easy because a lot of people want different things. Yeah, and things are coming and going. As yep. you mentioned. Yep, yep, yep. The uh, Valheim communities, so at least playthroughs, don't last for that long. People stay only for a few weeks building, and then by the time they finish all the all the content, they move on. And the people want fresh servers more than anything. Yeah, and, I, yeah. that seems to be very true based on the, the things I've done with YouTube and having servers. It's like... It's a genuine challenge to get, like, let's say you make some custom content or some experience, but it's in, like, the Mislands or the Ashlands. It's, like, genuinely challenging to get people to experience that. But if you just make some little thing in the Black Forest in the beginning of the game, oh, psh, you can just fill that server up immediately. Just like you're saying, they... Yeah. They really flock to the initial beginning experience. That's really, it's almost like a board game. You know, you yeah. like sit down with your friends and you play a board game for like, I don't know, a week. <laughs> that, that seems like a while for a board game, but that's the attitude uh, that people yeah. seem to have with Valheim. And it's, it's, it's like you said, it is challenging to, to run servers like that. Because you put, can put a lot of work into making this really composed server with lots of POIs and stuff. And then someone goes in and, okay, there's stuff built already. I don't want this, I'll go away. And you just sit there waiting for players to come in and appreciate your art. But then people just want something else. Yeah. It, it, oh, you've tapped into probably what is the, I would say the, the most recurring let's call it mistake in, in server development, where we think that because we made this cool, fun thing, that other people will have fun using it. Yeah. <laughs> but the fun is in building the thing in the first place. <laughs> so most of the time, it's really challenging to get people to come and join on a server, especially one that's already been used. And I, I, I do that, but I trick people, basically. I reset the days, and I reset the starting area. So it looks like no one has used the server. Fresh. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> but but really, the, the thing with Valheim that I think sort of enables all those is that, the, for example, like the, the locations, the dungeons don't respawn. Um, all of these, there's all these one-time occurrences. Where the game, really, if you're playing vanilla, I mean, it, it's a challenge to make it a long-term experience like really the game works against you to do that uh, yeah. because of how the boss progression works how one player progressing 
can drastically impact another player's experience, even if they never play together. Like that's a problem. Re like from a from a game development perspective, that creates problems because you're always going to have that one player who plays all the time, and those other players who don't play as much. You know, so <laughs> when you give that one player the ability to just <laughs> put goblins in the meadows. Uh, it, it causes problems, you know what I mean? And, and people become very, like you say, they, they join the world and they look to see, like, okay, how many boss stones are up? Is Are people done or are they still in the eek area? And if there's, like, let's say there's three boss stones up, people will leave immediately. Just they'll join, they'll see that there's boss stones progressed and done already, and they'll just leave. And, like, that, that is a common experience for people. Then from the other side, what can you do? You're not going to keep players forever, just waiting until we have a big enough number. Then those players will become bored, then we'll look for somewhere else. Yeah. It's yeah, no, really hard to act, to act to balance. At, at the end of the day, it's always going to be temporary. You know, Even the best of games, people are going to lose interest in. The, the way I try and work around it, though, is make it so... The main thing is the boss progression. So you have to have another way for people to progress without altering the entire server. Um, so I'm setting up a server with all this stuff in mind called the Path of Magic. And it basically has a, a solo boss progression. So instead of you going and fighting the bosses, the boss fights themselves are actually like gated to the end game. They're basically made to be sort of like instance fights that you do once you're really powerful. But instead of fighting the boss, you go and there's a chest at the boss altar, and you basically have to turn in materials of a certain kind based on a runestone next to the chest, and then you get the progression item for the boss. But you don't get the trophy and you don't get the power. But does, does that make sense? So like, you have a, sing, a single player and they go to the elder place and they want to get a crypt key so they can get iron. They don't actually have to kill the elder. I mean, they could, but... You know, in, the, in this circumstance, they have another option. Um, but so that, that part's really important if you want players to have their own experiences in the world. Because ideally, you should be able to have a world that's alive and individuals join, progress, and leave. And new individuals come, join, progress, and leave. Like, there's no reason that that shouldn't work. You can't make it so each individual stays forever. But you can make it so individuals come, have their experience and go. But as mentioned earlier, Valheim itself works against that if you do it vanilla. Like if you don't have respawning dungeons and locations and you don't have other features that really help people travel. Like on, on the server I do, it's a no map, no portal server. And like people fucking hate Ashlands in that experience. <laughs> like nobody, nobody wants to do uh, Ashlands on no map, no portal and even even when you do it, it it's it's not like a... I, I don't consider it an enjoyable experience. It, it requires a huge degree of preparation. And then just being in the Ashlands, you just consume resources like crazy to stay alive. So it's like... A, and it's hard to navigate in the Ashlands. It's really hard. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So, so I've worked around all that just by having... There's this like main path, a pre-built path. Um, and in certain parts, it goes up into the air. So basically... There's no portals, but because of how hard it is to keep track of things and how easy it is to get lost, I found that the no portal experience for players is much more approachable when there's a pre-built like main path that they can travel down. And like the way Valheim works, it basically makes the game around you as you explore. So when you travel down a path, it like spawns monsters and makes all these different things come up. Because if you have like 10 people going down one way of a path, you basically create loads of monsters, more monsters than would happen organically in the game. So all these weird <laughs> things happen, and it, it's really cool. But again, it, you have to modify the experience. Because if you're just yeah. doing vanilla, yeah, it can be real real rough. So, so Vanilla gameplay is normally the first thing that I will do, because limited resources is just some kind of great ore farm. I feel bad for cutting down trees. <laughs> yeah. I really feel bad because yeah, I'm just chopping the environment. Yeah, I, I I feel you there, and that's that's I think one of the reasons for that is because Valheim doesn't regrow the trees, right? So, yeah. so it's like kind of problematic in that way. But there's actually ways. Uh, like one of the things we've been doing on the Path of Magic server is making it so that fire grows trees and 
whenever something gets chopped, basically, if you leave the stump, for example, it can turn back into a tree. And so you can use a server-side mob called Expand World Prefabs to mm -hmm. edit the rules, and you can make the nature regrow. Like, you can make systems, many different systems that regrow the nature and do all sorts of stuff. So that's a whole uh, whole new world I'm trying to really open people's eyes to, because if you play Valheim, like, I'm not saying you need to mod it to all hell or anything, anything like that, but most people who play, there's usually, like, a gripe. You know what I mean? Like, something you were like, ah, if this one little thing was different, that'd be really cool. With, with Expand World Prefabs, you can literally make a Valheim server, and you add, like, a 5 to 10 text, uh, like, little text file, and then mm -hmm. it changes the thing you want. So, like I I'm mentioned, you can, you can make the I'm nature regrow, you can do all sorts of crazy stuff. I've been watching some of your videos on that as well. Yeah, I've just been cracking into the surface, really. It's, uh, it's going to be cool seeing what, what other people do with, with this sort of thing. And I have suggested your videos to a few server owners as well already. So, thank you for your job, by the way. Oh, thank, thanks for thanks for the suggestions. I'm I'm definitely trying to to network and meet other server owners and make make it so like the average Valheim person or person who cares about Valheim has more access to the resource and tools and information they need to, as I mentioned, make like custom experiences or, or do these things. Um, it's really cool seeing the kinds of projects people work on and like especially like I have my other interests and things that I do and I'll make like a tutorial not really thinking much of it but then I'll see like months later what somebody does off of that and the things that people make are really really cool it's like it's pretty mind-blowing to be honest so so we mentioned a bit about um, different experiences on different servers and finding other people to play with so now could you talk about just Valheim in general and try and like tap into why it is because you, you haven't played other games right no. so it's not like you have lots of other games to compare it to but maybe that's even well, more useful because why do you care about Valheim if you don't really care about other games there must be something about it right mainly because I have um, a group of friends that still plays nowadays that I met nearly at the start and uh, they still play Valheim from time to time, and we uh, maintain our, our own server. But, yeah, I don't know. Like I said, this game just talks to me. And I, I did try Nightingale for a short while. But the, although the mechanics were cool, the aesthetics didn't please me too much, and I just eventually came back to, to Valheim. It's standard AAA experience. <laughs> I'm always cautious. Whenever there's a lot of hype for something and the thing hasn't come out yet, I'm always yeah. like, eh, why are we so hyped? This is a typical bullshit, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I was very disappointed with that game. Although, still cool mechanics in the game, but the game was being constantly changed every single day. And, uh, nah, nah. Not my cup of tea. And Valheim keeps on a constant progression of... Every, every of the every part of the two last updates was amazing. The the mistlands completely wowed me. The ashlands, it, I was wowed for a whole week, saying, "Wow, this, wow that, what is this, what is that?" It, yeah, it just feeds the the need that I have to game. Yeah, I, I understand, especially the assets for both the mistlands and the ashlands. They're really like. Like, if you put aside, like, the experience people have in the beginning and old issues and all these things, um, the way that the assets and Ashlands look, and in the Mistlands as well, they're, they're beautiful. They both added so much to the game. And I like how, like, the Mistlands added a lot. And then the Ashlands added loads. And it makes me wonder, like, is the Deep North going to add, like, crazy amounts of stuff? Because they sort of talk about it that way. Like, um, if you listen to the interviews... They'll be like, ah, yep. oh, well, I mean, the Deep North is the last biome, so it should have every weapon type, right? And then they'll, they'll talk about build pieces and be like, ah, well, yeah, we left all the, all the pieces in the Deep North. Just wait till then. So it like makes you wonder. It's like, damn, 
how are they going to make that place so epic if the Ashlands is as epic as it is? Because to me, I don't know about you, but the Ashlands feels like the end game spot. It does. But lore wise, there's clear indication that the Deep North is going to be even even better. Because you want you want to get into that. We have, yeah, we have we have seven already of the of the Forsaken ones, and that was the final number of Forsaken ones. So I'm guessing we're gonna get like a super uber boss up there. Oh, I didn't even think about that. That that, that... The, the name of the boss is actually in the runestones already. If you look through the Ashland runestones, you'll find the name of it, the name of the final boss. That's pretty trippy. My mind is blown right now because I'm wondering because the the fader fight feels so much like an end game boss fight. You know, it's so it epic. Was, should be like the final mega king, but but no, there's something else. There's something else going on. Fader is not a bad guy. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe we find out we're actually the bad guy. <laughs> well. <laughs> We're all undead, so we should all just get along. Yeah, you'd think. Go go live with some Draugr. Yeah, good people. Good people. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. So, yeah. so oh, go on. There, there's something else I was trying to ask. I crossed no, my go mind for it, go for it. Let's see. Okay, so... So I think I'd like to ask you a bit about the combat itself in Valheim, because I have all my thoughts and feelings, and I won't try and get too tangential about those. But I'm wondering, for your sake, um, it sounds like... So I've noticed in others that really the things... I would say that the things that keep people playing Valheim are building, but I see now that it's not accurate, because really... The building is just a mechanism to play with others and share with others and interact with other people. And at the end of the day, the truth of it seems to be that the thing that keeps people playing Valheim are other people playing Valheim. And some of them may build and share things and it's like, because I mean, there's plenty of people who just build with dev commands and they never actually play the game and they play a lot and that's how they do it. They like build something, share it on YouTube, lose interest for a bit, find something in real life, get inspired, build it, share it on YouTube. Like that's how they they play, right? That's a whole whole way of doing it. But that's yeah, just sandbox way. players. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, whereas other people, like yourself, it seems to be that you you don't really care that much about the building aspect, but the the playing with others and saving other people and interacting with others in the combat, for you, that's the experience that makes you come back, right? I would assume it's not like without those other people to interact with. Is Valheim worth playing more? Mm, probably I would have been done with it a long time ago. If it wasn't for the interactability with others, for sure. It is a fine game, but like I said before, it is way better with others. And it's one of the reasons that people stick around is other people. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's very interesting. So I hadn't really... Like, I understood that the building was important because of the social aspect and the sharing and the interactions and the talking on forums and people saying, like, oh, wow, I like this. You know, that all those moments, they make an immersion, basically. So, for, in your case, what do you think is it about Valheim's combat and interaction that, that you like? It doesn't have to be like, oh, this is what makes it so special compared to other games. I just mean, like... What are your favorite bits about the experience of interacting with others and of fighting? Fighting with others, I like to. Well, I like to PvP as well a little bit, even though there aren't many people who like doing it in Valheim because it's not really prepared for that. Yeah. But I like to go with other people and seeing other people in combat, and if possible, learning with them and also teaching a bit a little bit seeing how others approach something. It's always very interesting because you normally you go sword in hand running towards the enemy. But not everyone does that and other people are more have more um, are more effective by not going in directly and that teaches you a little bit that sometimes you don't have to be a berserk. And <laughs> yeah. sometimes being an archer 
can be way more useful. Sometimes being a mage will be, well, almost every time, but sometimes being a mage will be more useful as well. So yeah, having different, seeing other people's different playstyles opens you up to different playstyles for yourself as well. Ah, that's interesting. Yeah, so it's like, because I'm thinking in, in a game like, let's say I'm playing, I just start a new character in a game like World of Warcraft or something, which has a, a turn-based combat system. If I go and fight an enemy, it's, as long as I have the same materials, it's exactly the same as when anyone else goes and fight an enemy. I just might be idiotic enough to try and fight three and get killed. But aside from that, there's not that much else that can happen. Whereas in Valheim, like, as you mentioned, yeah, like, so you can, like, run in all gung-ho and try and beat everything up and fight all of it. You can stay back, aggro one thing at a time. You can shoot something, bring it to you. There's a multitude of different ways to handle the combat and handle the fighting. So it makes sense what you're saying, because because there is that multitude, you can think you know the one way to do something, but then see someone else do it and, like be like wow I, I never thought of that before like a, a more recent example would be the Fenris armor everyone is gearing up in padded everyone is gearing up in in uh, Karapas to get to the Ashlands and then this one guy comes in with a Fenris armor and is like flash going back and forth and collecting <laughs> everything and well we're just there like what 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 where what yeah yeah, and sometimes the the hard approach is not the right approach. And that's one of the things I, the many things I loved about this game, is that the way you want to do it doesn't always mean it's the right way. You can still do it your way, and maybe that will be rewarding, but it doesn't mean it's the only way or the right way. Yeah, yeah, that's a good. They they say one of the. So I study game development, and there's these like pillars basically, that, that I believe in, that you should pretty much always follow, with very, very few exceptions. And one of those pillars is that everything should have three ways to do it. So, like, if you can only do something one way, yeah, you can make a game that's, that's good. But, like, if the, all the things in your game have three distinctly different ways to do them, without one, and here's another caveat, because if one of them is so much more effective, it invalidates the others. So realistically, there's only one way to do it. So you have to make it so like, not only are there three different options, but they're very comparable options, if that makes sense. And it, it, yep. it, how, how you describe the, the Fenring Arbor is interesting because on the very hard server, or on the, the path to Ashland server, uh, basically Fenring became the armor because like, you don't want to be slowed down because pretty much everything kills you in one hit anyway. So you want to move quickly. And it's funny because at first people don't, don't realize that. So they do, like you're saying, they progress normally. They use the harder harder armors and the ones that, you know, are heavy and slow you down. But then all it takes is them seeing one or two players in Fenring. And then, and then after like a month, everybody's in Fenring. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Screw this shit. I'm going to get some Fenris. Let's go to the mountains. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it, it, it's it's really cool seeing seeing how all these different things unfold. The same situation exactly happened with the root armor going into the mistlands. Everyone yeah, was that. going into bed, it's super slow, nobody can jump. Then suddenly someone takes a root armor and wait, I'm taking less damage. Yeah, Everyone's the chest, armor now. The, the pierce resistance in the chest yeah. in particular. And it's my, it's my go-to mistland armor to this day. Yeah, those are those are good updates from my perspective because it was additional, right? If I remember right, root was added to swamp with the abominations, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So there was yep, a point yep. where there were no abominations or any root armor, and I'm I, I'm one of those people. I like I, I I hate heavy armor. I don't even use shields. I like I make a point to like make everything except the heavy armor and the eight gears. But I know people love eight gears. So I'm not I'm not I'm not gonna shit talk people's favorite weapons and, and ah perfect transition because now I remember um, you had mentioned that one of the things you like to do is go through and play with different weapons than what you're used to. So could you share some of your stories with that? Sure. Um, normally people just go through the normal progression, which is the bat, the 
an axe and then they move up to a sword. I found that other ways are also quite effective that are not as that don't I think a lot about the resources of the world when I'm playing. But there are other weapons that can do the same kind of damage and are equally as good. Just like, for example, a simple chitin knife. Super cheap to make, super useful. I've never actually used it before that time, that playthrough. And suddenly I realized that you can do a lot of stuff with this little weapon. Same yeah, thing happened thing. to once I tried to progress only using the axes. Not my most, not my favorite one, but axes are quite effective as well if you if you get up to to a certain skill and now with the new axes from the from the ashlands even more and uh, they're multi-purpose another weapon the first weapon that i started doing this was the bow because i felt like i was horrible using bows i used bows for about three months and nothing else i would shoot everything in sight just to get a little bit of practice and then I found my favorite weapon, which is the bow. And yeah, you were able to progress. And then after I got really good with the bow, I thought, no, I have to stop this because otherwise I'm too reliant on a single weapon. Let's go and train with something else. And then I went back to swords. And after swords, I went back to clubs. And I just jump around from, from weapon to weapon, just so that I don't become too overly reliant on just one single type of weapon. Yeah, it's also, it's important to do it that way, because then you can find things that, I mean, like, I guess I understand when people mid-max in other games, because maybe it's competitive, or they're competing with each other, but in Valheim, I mean, there's no reward for, you know, like, killing the boss three seconds earlier than someone else, so in my head, you should be playing to have fun, so, yes. so really, it's all about, like, what weapon types are the most fun, and it, it, it's interesting you mentioned the bow experience there, because... I would assume that that's a very common experience for people in Valheim because the bows are so powerful, especially if you use like frost arrows. That's how you deal with like high difficulty mode. Like you just get frost arrows, then and then you can deal with with pretty much anything. Uh, so I would imagine many people have had that experience where they find that like they're always using bows, they're always using the the one weapon they're used to. But it can be really fun playing some other ones, and just to add. To that mentality um I, I in my most recent playthrough that's what i did i made a point like i'm gonna use the weapons that i thought were bullshit and that i ignored before and only use those weapons and the most surprising weapon i found was flesh rippers because they seem like underwhelming like if you look at the stats it's not like they do a whole bunch of damage or anything but what the stats don't show you is they have this middle mouse button kick attack and that thing stuns everything I, I don't know what it is about that attack but even on very hard mode you can run up to like a starred goblin and just kick it and it's it's insta stunned and like that is so profoundly useful i found myself using flesh rippers like as a utility tool to get that stun in and then sometimes switching to like a more damaging knife offset or that sort of thing but i, I definitely the initial. Yeah. yeah exactly exactly i definitely encourage people to try the different weapons out in Valheim because you can be really like you can think that one thing is the only way to do it but it is a game that has other options and I'm not saying everything's rewarding like the battle axes in particular um, I tried this mentality with them and like they just didn't feel epic and powerful enough at, at least on the harder difficulties but then again that's where this expand world prefab things come in and we can make anything uh, more powerful and heal more stamina. So, so I did like counters to make the battle axes more useful. They heal your stamina when you use them. They do loads of damage, um, and that makes them feel like yeah, they they pop and they're fun. But for the most part, it's definitely worth like exploring the different weapon types, even if just you're you're like just for the fun of it. Um, you may not you might not find that something is better, but you will find that things are more viable than you thought they were for sure. And would you say, what do you think a classic starter is? Because I know most people don't use knives, but then they use knives and they're like, whoa, these are actually pretty pretty strong. Yeah, going up against the troll, the thing that terrifies everyone in the beginning, and then you're able to, to stun him with a little knife, it's, it's an eye-opener. People see that and, wow, yeah, I can do something with this little thing. 
Yeah, I'm trying to think of other little surprises that people can investigate. So there's the 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 middle attack for the flesh rippers. Then let's see, are there other things people don't really know about? I, I guess people. Uh, yeah, the combos, the different. What do you mean by combos? Can you elaborate? Uh, there are certain uh, combinations that you can do in Valheim when you're attacking that trigger combos, attack combos. This is a bit unknown, but they do. They're extremely hard to do. Ah, like, okay. Uh, making multiple quick attacks with a knife or multiple quick attacks with a sword. Gotcha. So you're, you're talking about the, the sort of animation cancelling combos? Mm-hmm. Ah, gotcha. Yeah, so for, if you haven't heard about that, so there's two, two, sort of two combos, I guess. There's the, when you attack normally, certain weapons will have a pattern, right? So like, let's say you um, attack with the Krom, for example. It'll do like a regular, I guess I should pick a sword, I actually know the attack pattern for it, one second. I think it's the maces? There's one of them where like the third hit does a lot more damage, right? And it's like a, a wider swing. Whereas the first two are like slower, right? So like you have yep. you have a combo of attacks and depending on if you just attacked, it'll do a different animation and may do more damage or take longer. But that's not what Gorthar is talking about. There's in addition to that, there's like a way to sort of cancel the animation of the attack you're about to do and start a new attack so you end up getting in more attacks is, is that right mm -hmm. like one of the simpler ones is while you're holding up your shield you do an attack and as once the sword returns to a specific point you can let go of the block and do an additional attack and it will be even quicker than the previous one Ah, that's cool. I, I, I'd only seen more complex versions. I didn't know you could do it that way. And there's one person that does a very effective PvP combo. I don't know how he does it, but he's extremely effective, which is jumping forward while doing the thrust forward with the knife, with the sword. I have no idea how, but he does ah. it. It's, it's, it's unstoppable. <laughs> oh, that must be so tricky. That's cool. Uh, that guy kills almost everyone on PvP with a single shot. So, and so, yeah. so let's say someone wants to find people to PvP with in Valheim. What do they do? Where do they go? Well, normally the, I would start off by going through the Valheim Discord and checking which servers would have PvP on. There's a, a plethora of them. Um, um, the one that Bjorno does, Cataclysm, also has PvP elements on it. And they do have fights there. That's actually the, the reason why I joined that server, because they used to host um, cross-server PvP events. And yeah, there's there's people out there that can do really good fighting. It's still very janky. Like I said, it's not a game designed for PvP, but it, it's, it's doable. It's doable, and it can have some really surprising effects. It sounds like it'd be fun for like sort of, like let's say if I if I'm imagining like us having a whole server playthrough and PvP and trying to get people, I I, I don't know that it seems a bit weird to me. But if I imagine like a PvP tournament, you know where like it's a one-time event and people are like doing one-offs against each other, that sounds really I don't know, like something people are more uh, more interested in trying if that makes sense. Although, I maybe don't some see people a lot of interest. Well, like rest. I don't know. I don't see a lot of interest in people in fighting the PvP only servers because your stuff will get trashed. And in the end, most people like Just to build play rough. stuff. And... <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> most people will think, no, that's Rust. I don't want to play Rust. I want to play Valheim. Therefore, the, the PvP arenas and PvP zones within a normal server are much more appreciated yeah and for those of you watching there is actually a youtube channel one second i'll show it i think it's called arena high arena high heard of them as well i've heard, heard. yeah they basically do not arena high arena world is that it 
Yeah, they basically only do, they make like custom, yeah, arena world, that's it. They make like custom arenas using um, all sorts of things. So they also use expand world prefabs, the thing that I'd mentioned. And so <laughs> like I've seen some of their videos and like you'll have like a, a color of your team and then like based on where you are, the color of your character automatically is like determined. And like, so they, they have all these little, they use expand world prefabs to alter the rules and then they make like a game type. So it's not like you play through the whole, you know, Valheim experience that way. It's more like uh, one afternoon you join for that event and then they're having a tournament or they're having a raft race or they're having a carve race or some PVP event. Um, so they make like one-off things like that. And some of them are really, really in depth. And it's like, I can tell it's like, this is a two minute video, but I can tell like people took weeks preparing for this. <laughs> they're, they're really cool. Here's, I'll send you a link to the channel one second. I, I'm, I'm watching it right now as well. Ah, you found it, awesome. Yeah, I've already seen a few of them. The one that looks like a funnel looks very interesting. Very, yeah. With a funnel at the, yeah, it's right here. Yeah, they have some With crazy fun ideas. Spike at the end. That looks fun. Because to me, a lot of people get really annoyed and really upset whenever they die in Valheim. Yeah. You'll see a smile stretching from here to here in my face whenever I die. <laughs> it, and the, the more ridiculous or the more glorious, the better. Yeah, I, I relate to you as well. I mean, that's, that's kind of why my attitude is on the server. When the character dies, it explodes. So it uses the, the animation from Motor when she dies so that she just, like that way when you see another character die, you immediately know they died. And I try and go for that same attitude. It's like, how do we make dying as fun as possible? Because it doesn't need to be a horrible thing. It's only horrible if like your corpse running and going back there and subjecting yourself to that over and over again. Death loops are not, nobody likes like them likes death yeah. loops, but but a spectacular fight with the queen where she slaps you and you fall from the last floor all the way to the bottom. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel you. I, I really or, wish. Or even that... I'm walking into the queen and I see someone else that that happened to. I'm gonna laugh my ass off. Yeah, it is. I mean, honestly, seeing other people get ganked, especially when like. You, you see it about to happen and you try and warn them or something, but it was too late. You know? Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. It's funny. Yeah. A yeah. lot of people get really upset and really annoyed and I tell them, why did you get those good points? Yeah. Because of this. But I was so you just can about die to say and have fun and continue playing. System. Yeah. But that, that's, people have that. Yeah, that's a whole other thing in Valheim is how the skill system works. Because I'm of the belief that you could remove the skill system entirely and just have everybody's skill set at 50. And it wouldn't actually change the game that much. Um, 50 is plenty. Which is like, uh, the only the only reason the skills matter is because your your weapon skill starts so low that like you need to raise it to be able to do some damage. But that's like an artificial uh, constraint that... I, I personally, I don't know, like I get having a skill system, but it seems sort of gimmicky. And from my perspective, just like you said, um, all it does really is make people hesitant to go out and explore, hesitant to go out and put themselves in danger. And then when they actually die, they feel like something was taken from them. Because yeah. like losing 5%, if you have a max skill, <laughs> you immediately lose five levels. And that's like, um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 exactly. I, I don't blame people. And I, even setting that to one, which is the lowest in vanilla, like it still is a, a huge cap. If you like, <laughs> I die a lot. Okay. Like I can look at, like I play on no map, but sometimes I'll, uh, I'll remove the, I'll like look at the map just to see how many times I've died when I'm doing like admin work on the server or something. And it's just everywhere. There's like just skulls everywhere I've been. And the problem for me is when I play normally, like my skills literally cannot pass 20. 
Like, I don't even bother with the skill system because if I get a skill past 30, it's only a matter of time before I die like four times in a row right after the corpse run buff disappears, you know, and I lose everything. So so that, that you've touched on something there that personally I think could use some work. Because um, really, if a system exists and you can just get rid of it, like, why does it exist, <laughs> you know? You know, I actually made that system into a more positive thing by building gyms for people to skill up ah, and yeah. by building gyms you get people in the same house talking to each other and socializing yeah because they have to do it for a while people, too. people that would be running against the wall inside their little shack <laughs> are going to be running against the wall next to two other guys running against the wall and talking about it that's pretty funny and suddenly like there's that. a raid outside and the three of them go outside and kill the creatures or not or get killed yeah and that that also generates a little bit of content within the game yeah because then people are actually interacting with each other that's uh th there's a couple of interesting ways to handle that one of the one of the mods with skill systems makes it so instead of losing something what happens is if you make if you progress through skills without dying you get this buff that basically makes you get more experience and then when you die, you lose that buff. So you have to reset it. So you do lose something, but you lose an advantage instead of losing the skill level your penalty. itself. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. That's a cool way to go about it. And then another way that uh, I saw in one of the playthroughs, we used Valheim Plus, and we made it so the experience rate was like 10 times higher. Um, and it sounds like it wouldn't work, but because of Valheim's death penalty, it actually is really balanced. And we found that what would happen is you can get experience so quickly that you're sort of incentivized before you go do a fight, you like train a little bit. For, I'm not talking about much, maybe like 30 seconds or two minutes or something, just to get your experience points back up. And then if you go die, you lose them, but you can get them back so quickly that felt really balanced, like more balanced than the way the game is. So I just say that the simplest change would seem to be increasing the rate at which people get experience because it's really low in normal yeah. vanilla Valheim, like really, really slow. And especially when you're losing 5% of that when you die, I mean, and it's really slow, that's no wonder people get pissed. <laughs> And it consumes food, and it consumes a lot of resources to skill up in Valheim. Yeah, yeah, definitely. If you're a mage, you have to consume food. There's no, no way around it. I can train with no food for any kind of combat, but for mage stuff, there's... you got to have A tier, so... Yeah, you can't even cast the... That's something else that I... my two cents about progression in Valheim they should have retroactively incorporated magic into the world once they did the uh, Mistlands. Yeah, so, so how do you even think if they could go about that? Make a little little stuff that makes light. Just so players get introduced ah. to, to magic. Nothing if nothing that's combative wise, but something that you would start getting some Utility experience stuff. from it. Yeah. Like a torch. Some, yeah. Doesn't oh, need to be really game breaking or give you any extra powers. Just a little like like the wisp light, but something that wouldn't work with it. That maybe you could even progress to make it work in the mistlands, but something that would just give you a light in in the in the caves. Wouldn't yeah, make you so a super OP mage, but it would make you an initiate. Yeah, and people could get a get their feet wet, so to speak, about yeah. the magic system in the first place. That that's interesting because I've heard I've heard people ask Iron Gate about that, but the counter was always like, oh, it'd be too strong, but yeah, like, why not just do it a utility thing that's not even yeah. useful in combat? That, that, that That's a very interesting point. I like that. To make a little fire that gives people temporary a little light that gives people temporary one comfort, something like that. Something banal and that wouldn't change gameplay too much. And yeah, would get people perfectly into magic. Yeah, maybe something like the like the leather armor, for example. Um, not the leather, the rag armor. There we go. It, mm -hmm. 
utility, I mean, gameplay-wise, serves almost zero purpose. Like, it's yeah. you can just make the leather armor, but the whole point is, like, the purpose of the rags isn't a viable combat thing. It's to show you that things are craftable, and this is how you make stuff, and there's a workbench, and you go there, and you take materials, and that's why the rags exist, to serve that purpose, right? So there's no reason yeah. that magic couldn't have something like that as well. Yeah, that, there wouldn't you, you be any need to, to make recipes for food or anything. Just a simple mushroom with it you're growing in the in the meadows or in the black forest. Okay, black forest be it. A little mushroom that gives you a little bit of it here just so you can cast a little, little something. Yeah, or they could just add, you know, like honey gives you five eater. Something tiny. Yeah. You know, yeah. something little. Doesn't even need to be a new item, really. Yep, 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 yep. Huh, that's cool. Well, I think I've, I've covered most of the things I wanted to ask. Is, is there anything that you want to say to people or you'd like to discuss before we end the call? No, I think that'll be all. I just want to say that to everyone that's out there playing Valheim and looking for a, a place to play in, keep on looking. Don't settle. Look for something that fits you. And then have the time of your life. <laughs> Yeah, it's all about just finding those groups. And honestly, yeah. as you mentioned, there's many ways to go about finding it. So I have a feeling it's more that people think they won't be able to find other players like them. Not so much that the means to find those other players don't exist. So as Gorthar mentioned, just keep looking. And if you don't feel good about the people you're playing with now, you don't feel like that connection, they just keep keep looking, and you'll you'll eventually find a group of people that you really really enjoy playing with. Uh, and it will be magical when you find them. Yes, it will be yes. wonderful. Yeah, and that 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 seems to be a a recurring theme in people's Valheim stories. To be honest, where there's a period of time where people sort of they're the person that loved Valheim a lot, and maybe they played with a group, but the people that they were playing with moved on to other games and don't really want to play Valheim anymore. It's pretty typical. So there's normally this sort of sad period where the one who loves Valheim really wants to play Valheim with other people, but the people they played with just don't care. <laughs> you know, in, yeah. in my in my case, it was sort of like that. I would play Valheim with one of my friends. And like he's a really close friend of mine in real life, one of the people I'm closest to. But like he just doesn't... Like, he says he likes Valheim, but I know that he's playing to play a game with me, and it's more about talking yeah. with each other and hanging out. It's not really Valheim, you know what I mean? And I know that because, yeah. like, he never never joins the server if I'm not on. Always, like, make sure I'm there so that we then play together, and this sort of thing. So, like, for me, it was kind of frustrating, because I was eternally, I was, like, trying to play Valheim, but then, like, I would want to play more than my friend wants to play. So I'd log in and want to do something, but then they'd, like, get mad at me for doing something when they weren't there. Yeah. But then yeah. I want them to play when they're not, when I'm not there. I would love it, you know, to log into the world and something's different because they built something in the base, or, you know, and, and yeah. that just never happened. But then I start making YouTube videos and then, boom, suddenly it's, like, infinite people to play Valheim with who love Valheim and play it more than I do. That's awesome. And it's like, shit, these people were there the whole time. <laughs> like, you know, it's just a matter of, of finding finding the people and connecting with them. Um, and obviously, like, making YouTube content is a... It puts you in a posi an advantageous position to find people to play with. But you don't need to go that far. You know, you can do, just like you mentioned, just joining Discord channels, um, browsing them, and eventually you'll get lucky. You'll find something. And also, you can yeah. use YouTube but not even make your own content. Like you said, you can just watch what other people are doing and you'll inevitably find somebody who has a server that's open yep. <laughs> mm -hmm. that's how i found your rock just watching videos and seeing one of the intros he did and it was it blew me away and i had to had to partake in that that's awesome all right everybody that's it for this video we'll see you in the next one Bye bye